export oil and have made arrangements in the last three years with state-owned oil companies by loaning cash for oil. China has funded up to $120 billion in loans to a number of state-owned oil companies in return for first oil to pay back the cash loans. So they won't be repaid in cash, they'll be repaid in the equivalent oil value. A couple of examples. Brazil has received $10 billion, Venezuela $20 billion, Russia $25 billion, Kazakhstan $10 billion, Ghana $16 billion. Now Ghana only produced first oil ever in its history a year ago this month, but already have received $16 billion in cash from China in return for oil. Nigeria $23 billion. Again, these statistics from Wen Ren Zhang. The consequence of this oil being contracted as cash for oil means that as China moves from 9 million to 15 million, this oil comes to them first, before it would go to the global trading market. I wonder if you could think of a country that lives off imports from the global trading market. We live in one. Somewhere near 50% of the oil we consume every day. It's been as high as 65% of the oil we consume every day comes from imported oil. That amount of oil that China needs, 6 million barrels a day, in addition to the current, will come first to them, which means that the global oil supply, just to satisfy China's needs, will go from today's 88 million barrels a day to 94 million barrels a day. And by the way, China is not the only developing country looking for more oil. India is expected, again from Wen Ren Zhang, to go from 4 million barrels a day today to 7 million barrels a day by 2015. It's not difficult to suggest that other developing world countries will also increase their demand for oil by anywhere from 1 to 2 million barrels a day by 2015. So the reality is we're looking at an 88 million barrel per day supply, which as you know from reading your current events over the last two or three years, is very difficult to achieve under the precarious state of geopolitical issues in particularly important oil basins, such as Middle East, Russia, the stands, Kazakhstan, etc., Brazil has yet to really develop material oil because while it has discovered vast quantities of oil, it is deep under the earth in high pressure and high temperatures and it's probably late this decade and into the next decade before we have the technologies perfected to bring that oil out safely. Venezuela is another troubled country. Mexico is another troubled country, which are big oil providers. So the consequence here is that the need for U.S. to obtain somewhere between 10 to 13 million barrels a day of imports is at risk given that the world goes from 88 to roughly 96 or 98 million barrels a day within three years. And there is no known near-term supply to meet that demand. So if anyone thinks the year has started off with high oil prices at $100 a barrel, yes it has. And if anyone believes and hopes in economic recovery in this country and reduced unemployment in this country, and I know at least one person at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue who's counting on it, as well as one of several over in Tampa tonight <laughs> counting on it, we can expect continued pressure, upside pressure, on the year as we progress on the oil price to the point that I predicted 15 months ago, 13 months ago, sorry, that we could expect $5 gasoline in the latter part of 2012, given this information. And that situation is likely to sustain itself unless or until economic recession creates demand destruction for future energy resources. So that's a preface 
of looking around the world, at least at the other side of the world, on what is happening in at least one major developing country. Let's go to scenario A, business as usual. Business as usual in the energy space in this country looks like the following. The 20th century built out the world's most marvelous, exciting, technologically proficient, technologically advanced, and from what we knew then, the most efficient, largest energy system the world has ever known. From the late 1800s through the 20th century, Katie, bar the door. We developed personal mobility. We developed lifestyle convenience. We experienced national energy security. We experienced the good life, the growing good life for a hundred years, fueled by domestic energy, which made our lives richer, enabled things to happen that no one could have believed in our grandparents' communities when they were growing up. And that situation has continued through the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. And now we're in the second decade of the 21st century. And we still have that 20th century system band-aided in parts, aging rapidly in major parts, but still producing the energy that this country needs to sustain the world's largest economy. Prices have increased, have you noticed? Prices have increased because of the pressure and the tension that exists on the supply side. Domestic drilling in this country got as high as 10 million barrels a day. Today it's under 7. Thus, the need for imports. But still, we use 20 million barrels a day. China's only at 9. We're at 20. Well, with the recession, we got down to about 18 and a half, but we're back up above 19 again. We use, for most, most of our electricity, or much of our electricity, we use the nation's coal supply. 49% of electrons that keep our lights on, keep our air conditioners humming, or keep us warm in the winter in parts of the country, 49% of electrons that power our PCs and keep universities and hospitals and banks running day in and day out comes from coal. We produce coal to the rate of burning one rail car of coal every three seconds. If you do the math, that's 1,200 carloads of coal per hour. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's how much coal we consume. The 20 million barrels of oil a day translates into 10,000 gallons a day. A, a second, sorry, 10,000 gallons a second. That's a lot in a minute, let alone an hour. Natural gas, we consume 60 billion cubic feet a day. If we stacked 60 billion cubic feet on top of each other, we go from here to the moon and back 25 times every day. We have 104 nuclear plants, turning out roughly 20% of the nation's electricity. If we count natural gas, coal, nuclear, and hydropower, the dams in this country that produce electricity, 98% of our electricity comes from those four sources. Oil is only a modest contribution to electricity supply because oil is primarily used for transportation and petrochemicals. So 98% of our daily consumption of energy comes from four sources. Wind, solar, biofuels, geothermal, hydrogen, and one more that's escaping me. I'm from Texas, so forgive my memory loss. <laughs> but it's 10, not 3. So I represent 2% of our energy supply. So when we talk about the future of wind and solar, the future of biofuels, we can double it. We can double it again. We're still at single-digit supply of energy. Business as usual also looks like 
President Nixon, in the first Arab oil embargo, saying in November 1973, after four weeks of oil shortage, self-made, I might add, self-made oil shortage, I'll explain that in a moment, that we would have energy independence in this country in seven years under his leadership. That was 1973. And he didn't last much longer in office.